This Southern weekend, we're off to the races. We're talking horses, hats, and of course, mint juleps. How do they do this? We'll shadow box with a champion. Man, I need to come here every weekend. We'll head underground for a zipping good time. And of course, we'll have plenty of good food and drinks along the way. Ready, go. We're taking a road trip to Louisville, Kentucky, right now on the Southern Weekend. I'm Molly McKinney. I travel across the South meeting amazing people. We're dancing, we're having a good oh, time. Right. We're tasting delicious food. That is outstanding. And exploring great new places to visit. I love weekends in the South, and I think you will too. Let's go check it out. So come join the adventure as we start the Southern Weekend. Louisville, Kentucky is one of our favorite cities to visit for a southern weekend. It's known for its charm, bourbon, and of course, horses. And this is one of the best times to visit as the city prepares for the pageantry that is the Kentucky Derby. So our first stop on this southern weekend, the Kentucky Derby Museum. It's located next to historic Churchill Downs and is a great place to celebrate the pageantry of the Derby year round. The museum is filled with a fascinating mix of racing history and interactive attractions. You can strap on your boots and ride a virtual horse, yeah! place a pretend bet, and even do your best announcing impression. And it's a three-way go on the outside, Susie's gal, between horses, perfect for you, towards the inside. How do they do this? I also got the chance to experience another derby tradition, the hats. So when I think of the Kentucky Derby, I think of horses, and then I immediately think hats. Yes. So you're the leading <laughs> expert on hats. So what goes into picking the right hat for the Kentucky Derby? Well, there's lots of different types of hats. Of course, the big brim, like the one you're <laughs> picking up right now, <laughs> um, is a classic derby hat. It's perfect for the springtime when the derby takes place. It blocks, you know, sun coverage. Keeps you and cool. it's just, yeah, you it keeps cool. you cool. You look cool. And it's just a very nice, feminine, classic look. Where did the hats originate from? I mean, it seems like they've been such a southern staple since the beginning yes. of the derby. Well, hats have been a part of the Derby from the very beginning, from the 1800s. And it is very much a southern uh, look and feel to begin with. That looks great on you. Go on, <laughs> tell me more. But it also provided, they thought, good luck for them to wear a oh, hat. really? So that caused people every year to wear hats more and more because they felt that it brought luck to them. It must be so fun to see at the Derby, all the different hats. Oh, it hats. is. <laughs> I want to try this one on. Beautiful. <laughs> So you can wear it, it feels well. large. <laughs> is it, is but it, it looks as large beautiful. as it feels? <laughs> All right, I just have to find a dress now. Yep, go with the hat. start with the hat start first. With hat first. <laughs> first things first. Before we left the museum, there was one more stop and one more taste of the Derby. So Kentucky is known for bourbon. That's right. And the Kentucky Derby is known for the mint julep. So this year, they'll, they'll drink between 120,000 and 140,000 mint juleps while they're uh, betting on uh, various sources. Day. Absolutely. Wow. They'll, they'll drink a lot. And it's a real easy drink to make. All you need is sugar, water, mint, and, and of course, bourbon. So the first thing you want to do is you want to grab five mint leaves. Okay. The next step, get a, um, a, a teaspoon of sugar. I felt like you were going, oh, this, is this sugar? This is powdered sugar. Okay. I also like using caster sugar. So basically you want something that will dissolve e easily. Okay. And this is your water here. Okay. You want to do two teaspoons of that, so two of that. Okay. And now you're going to grab your muddler. So this is your muddler. Uh, you're going to, to muddle. This is? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you push it down, but don't, don't bang it. You just want to gently do that. And now give it a mix so that it Mix it around with the muddler there. Good thing you're here. Okay, that's good. Now add, uh, fill it with ice. Ice tends to dissolve very quickly in this. So this is a this is a jigger. Um, okay. Do two do two of those. Yeah, we're. Good. I want to make sure you get the bourbon <laughs> in there. <laughs> Might be a real short segment of the <laughs> Now, once you're done there, you're gonna take your bar spoon and just mix it. And so now just find uh, a nice sprig of mint. So whatever your favorite is, just plop it in. And now you have a julep. Voila. Cheers. Try it. Yeah, absolutely. It smells really good. Mm. Yes. Yeah. There's, there's bourbon in there. Yeah. 
that we loaded you up with some good bourbon. I, I gotta give you some kudos. That is a great jewel. Still to come. What's the oldest thing in this place? Me. We visit a Louisville antique shop you need to see to believe. If you want to see more from any of our road trips, check out thesouthernweekend.com. You'll find videos of our adventures across the South, as well as great tips and recipes. All that and more anytime you want it at thesouthernweekend.com. We love our Southern Weekend road trips because we get to meet such interesting people and explore unusual places. And that's exactly what we found at an antique shop right here in Louisville, Kentucky. What's the oldest thing in this place? Me. <laughs> Joe Lay Antiques is a one-of-a-kind antique store with a little something for everyone. Everything inside has a story to tell, including the owner, Joe Lay himself. How did you get started in collecting antiques? Uh, it's a sad story. I got orphaned out as a child, very young. I stayed with a lot of farm families, so I just got attached to everything. I think as a child, when you don't have toys and you don't have anything like that, I think everything meant something to me. So I started gathering up stuff and trying to borrow people's garages, the store down and trunk, anywhere they let me put it. And then it became a real se severe habit. <laughs> Is there any way to explain how large of a property you have? We just, got, we just got a name called Two Acres Under Roof. <laughs> it's, just, it's easier than trying to say, I don't, let's see, how many square feet is there in there? People say, do you say, do you know what's in this building? I say, I know what I got. I just don't know where it's at. <laughs> I bet some of these pieces in here have some really great stories. I think some of them talk. <laughs> <laughs> Would you show us around and share some of the stories? Absolutely, I'd love to. This is our main center hall here, basically, and all the people that could go four, five, six different ways. And usually I have a family reunion in here, and they hadn't seen each other for a long time. And, oh, Molly, oh, how you been? <laughs> and nobody can get through anyway. This is some of the mantles and things and stuff that we salvage from well, some of these old mansions and stuff that's coming down. And that's they're getting harder and harder to find every day. We don't get, we just don't get the stuff that we used to get. I used to have a head in this suit of armor. I had a wax head in there. Everybody wants to touch everything, you know, and the kids want to touch the blades and oh, they'll yeah. lift the head up and that face was in there. Now this, this horse here came from our Fountain Ferry Park was our amusement park here in Louisville, Kentucky. And I think the most exciting thing that I've seen in there, I thought, was the merry-go-round with all the carousels and the horses. I said, I'm going to buy every horse I, I can find. And then I realized there was more horses than I had money. <laughs> so I couldn't buy every one. 
this was one of the games that was in Fountain Prairie Park, and they, they had a roll of these, and you took a ball, ping pong ball, like, and you tried to throw it in his mouth. But see this pipe? They had air kind of blowing up through there, so when it went in and come back out, you didn't win no teddy bear. <laughs> yeah. Got so much bourbon and stuff in this area. We even collect these old bottles and stuff that people used to collect, the bean bottles and so forth, and the bourbon bottles over there, in which we have, obviously, you can see hundreds of them around. Why did you decide to stay in Louisville and run this company here? Well, Louisville's a beautiful town. It just looked like a gold mine of stuff to me. The money part never did have anything to do with me, as you probably can tell. I mean, I, I, just, I just love the stuff. During our visit to Louisville, we were invited to try something hot. And I do mean hot, with a visit to Joella's Hot Chicken. Hi. Hi. Hi, Joella. Thank you. I've never been here before. Oh. What's good? Well, the wings are really good. All the chicken's really good. And are those different degrees of spiciness? They range from southern to fire in the home. <laughs> the southern is going to be like your plain fried chicken, like okay. Mama used to make it. And tweener. Then, tweener. <laughs> tweener. Tweener is like a comfortable name. spice. Tweener. And then hot, which is my favorite. Oh. I love hot. Kind of, you know, kind of makes you cry a little bit, but. It's and you enjoy this? Yeah, it's maintainable. Okay. And then you have one above that? Mm -hmm. Fire in the hole. Can you do that one? So you like a temperature that makes your eyes water, and you can't do fire in the hole. Oh, hall. no, no, no. Fire That's in the hole is just for me. too hot. I feel like you're challenging me. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll let you try fire <laughs> if you don't believe but me. But you're going to say, I told you so. Yeah. <laughs> OK, let's try it. All right. Challenge accepted, it was time to eat. Yum. You said that one right here. Right. <laughs> Thank you. And to help me navigate the heat, I got some help from the Joella team. Yum. I would really like to try the chicken and waffles. So this is going to be our Alice favorite chicken. Our chicken is marinated for 24 hours in a homemade brine that we came up with. And then we hand toss our chicken in our special breader. And then you base it in hello sauce? Correct. It's very mild with a little bit of sweet. I had never heard of hot chicken before, other than someone saying that chicken is, is hot. It's just come <laughs> out of a fryer. Hot chicken itself is the oil that you put onto the chicken that gives the chicken the flair and the flavor of the heat level that you desire. We just reinvented the wheel and brought it back to Louisville. And this is a huge bite. So the, all the flares and flavor of the chicken first. Whoa. You know, a little sweet, very little heat. I'm building confidence. I know that's the baby one oh, you're, of the spice oh, yeah. level, but I can at least do that one. So this is tweener. Tweener is the next level up, okay. so you'll have a little bit of heat. There's a little bit of heat in that one. Yeah. I'm gonna take a little sip of my drink real quick. You got milk in there? No, I probably should. Maybe you should go get some. You still have the hot and the fire to try. So we'll just slide this over. Get ready to rip this wing apart. I think you're in this with me, then. You're gonna make me do this. You need to do one, too. Just dip it and rip it. Ready? Go. Right away, you can taste the heat. Mm-hmm. It's getting a little hotter. Mm-hmm. Tongue's feeling it. Yeah. Lips are feeling it. I can feel it back here now. You yeah. can feel it. <laughs> I'm terrified. This so the red torture. means fire. The if red means fire? Yes, fire in the hole. You ready Lord. for this? Yeah. Let's do a high tender. <laughs> ready? Yeah. One, two, three, go. I... <laughs> Are you tearing right now? You eat this for fun? People love this. This is so painful. <laughs> <laughs> we use some of the hottest peppers right in the world. <laughs> so what pepper blend goes in that? We use a, a Carolina sweating. Reaper powder, by the way. It is one of the hottest peppers in the world. You told me this now. And we cool it down with ghost, I don't think you cool it down the, enough. With the ghost chili pepper. That's how we cool it down. I need milk. <laughs> you need milk? We'll get you milk right now. This is a milk emergency. This works. It does work. It'll cool it down. That did help. Good job. Thank you. Very proud of you. It's still. Would you like another bite? Still, no. Still to come. He was known around the world to float like a butterfly and sting like a bee, but Louisville calls him one of their own. And later, we love a good zip line, but we've never experienced one like this before.
Muhammad Ali was a captivating and complex figure, known as much for his peaceful activism as his powerful punches. So when we were invited to the Muhammad Ali Center, we couldn't wait to learn more about the man they call the greatest of all time. The Ali Center is the place that Mr. and Mrs. Ali wanted to be built because it would carry on Muhammad's legacy for many generations to come. And so that's why it was so important for both of them that the center be built here in their hometown. What's the most important takeaways to include in the center? Mm -hmm. From the time that Muhammad Ali was a very young boy, he lived his life by certain ideals, confidence, conviction, dedication, respect, spirituality, and giving. We use those six core principles as touch points for our visitors. Walk me through the different experiences that one can find when they visit the center. The Ali Center is almost 100,000 square feet. Two and a half levels are award-winning exhibits. There's also an area that showcases Muhammad's professional boxing career, an interactive area where kids of all ages can hit the speed bag or the heavy bag and learn how to box. It's a very Maybe fun adults area. too. <laughs> very, yes, big, big kids. Big kids. <laughs> Man, I need to come here every weekend. There's a very inspiring exhibit called Lighting the Way, and this focuses on the 1996 torchlighting experience at the Olympics in Atlanta, where they can learn about Muhammad Ali's humanitarian timeline, which was a big part of his life. He used boxing to become a great humanitarian, to transcend sports, to inspire young kids, old kids, older people to be as great as they can be. It really is a journey through the life of Muhammad Ali. His ability as a iconic figure to unite people. And what a special place to house it here in Louisville, Kentucky. And you can read all throughout the center areas of the city that he had these major red bike moments, like you all call them. Absolutely. Well, his first red bike moment was when his swim bike was stolen. And of course, you know, Muhammad being Muhammad said, I'm gonna whip the thief that's, that took my bike. And Joe Martin, the police officer who's now famous for introducing Muhammad Ali to boxing, Joe took him to uh, the Columbia Boxing Gym and taught him the fight. And it seems like he wanted the center to be a place where anyone could walk in and feel inspired and motivated to become their best self when they leave. Absolutely, and that's one of the unique aspects of the center. And most people come here expecting to see a boxing museum. I, that's exactly what I was expecting. Right, and then you go through this journey of this man who transcended sports. But if you read what's written on the walls of the center and in our exhibits, it gives you the ability to, to self-reflect, to, to be introspective and think about what you can do as a person to become great. Kentucky is known for its spirits, but it was also home to the first commercial vineyard in the United States. And it's the current home to a growing wine movement. So while visiting Louisville, we got the chance to learn more about Kentucky wine and taste a glass made with a local twist. To be honest, when I think of wine country in the United States, Kentucky isn't the first state that comes to wines for me. Yeah, um, I don't think many people do think about Kentucky when they think about wine. Here in Kentucky, um, the wine industry has really grown quickly. In 1990, there were uh, almost no wineries. There may have been one or two. In 2000, there were just a handful of wineries. And now in 2017, we have 70 plus wineries and growing. Based on the grapes that you're able to grow in Kentucky, what varieties of wines can you produce here? So it's kind of an exciting time to be part of the wine industry in Kentucky because it's, it's so young that there's just so much experimentation going on. Here it's a little bit of everything. You know, we have, we do have a little bit of Cabernet Sauvignon, we've got some Cabernet Franc. There's a lot of native varieties. We're doing a lot of Concord, a lot of Niagara, and then also a lot of fruit wine. So it's really all over the board. You can basically get any experience of uh, visiting a winery that, that you could ask for here in Kentucky, you know, whether it's out visiting kind of that traditional vineyard, winery, picturesque scene that you think of when you think of visiting a winery, or coming somewhere like Old 502 where we are today, where it's an urban winery in the middle of the city. While at the Old 502, I got to sample one of their specialties, wine aged with the help of another Kentucky staple. So I'm drinking the Bourbon Barrel Red. That's correct. Are these the bourbon barrels that this red comes from? <laughs> it, it actually is. We actually 
age uh, red wine and bourbon barrel for a short period of time. That's actually so what that's you what have I mean. in your head. Well, we're taking that, that barrel after we've had bourbon sitting in it for five to 10 years and putting wine in it, but only for about 30 days. So we just, just get an essence of it. Can you taste the bourbon in, in it? Just a little bit, it's should very it? subtle. Sure, you should try it. Very, get a little in the nose, maybe a little in the finish, but it's very subtle. Oh, that's delicious. Well, I'm glad you that's like great. it. That's great. I don't know if I can taste the bourbon. <laughs> it's real good. <laughs> maybe I need to drink the whole glass. That's why we sell more of it. Bourbon. Exactly. <laughs> For much more about Kentucky wine and how you can travel the Kentucky Wine Trail, check out our website at thesouthernweekend.com. Louisville, Kentucky is known for many things like bourbon and thoroughbred horses and a cavern located underneath the city that you can explore on a zip line. That sounds really intense. Let's go check it out. This place is like a fantasy world. There's so many things that you can do here. I had no idea this existed in Louisville. Taylor, what is the history of this cavern? Is it naturally forming or man-made? Uh, it was an active limestone mine up until 1976. We started doing tourism attractions here in 2008. I would never think of doing any of this stuff underground. So we've got the tram tours, which are historic driving tours. You're on a Jeep with a trailer. It's a ropes course. There are a total of 76 elements on there, including a couple of short zip lines, suspension bridges. We have the mega bike park. There are probably six miles worth of trails inside there. We've got the zip line tours. We're gonna be riding along on three quarter inch stainless steel cables, uh, completely fully guided. Your guides handle all the equipment for you. Looks like I know what I'm doing. I have no idea what any of this stuff does. It looks important though. So I have done a zip line before. This one is a little different. It is two hours underground in a cavern in the dark, and so I'm real excited to do something a little outside of my comfort zone. Behind me is what they call the bunny zip, and it's just a place where we can practice. They clearly know what they're doing. This is a place for us to figure out what we're doing before we get on the big zip line. This. Yeah, with the boobs. Yeah. We had one 
last stop on our Louisville road trip, a visit to Merle's Whiskey Kitchen. It's known for its great food, terrific atmosphere, and was the perfect place to get a lesson on bourbon whiskey and how to make a classic Louisville drink the old fashioned. How long has this building been here that you all are occupying um, now? The building we are operating in uh, was built in 1870, and it's been a bar since after Prohibition. The bar inside actually was hand built um, before Prohibition, uh, and it's still here today. So once and for all, can you educate me on the difference between whiskey and bourbon? Okay, yeah, that's, that's an easy one. Beyond popular belief, bourbon does not have to come from Kentucky. It can actually be made anywhere, but it does have to be made in the United States. It does have to have a brand new charred container. Uh, it has to be charred oak. Okay. You can only use it once, you can't use it again. Why? Um, that's just the rules. Uh, that's, how, that's how it is, that's how they make it. If you use it, this container again, it's considered American whiskey. A lot of it has to do with um, the grain as well. It has to be 51% corn, uh, which makes it sweet. Um, and then we use some other uh, flavoring agents, uh, malted barley, uh, some people use wheat, some people use rye, um, and they do it in different percentages to actually make the bourbon have its flavor. We have over 120 Kentucky bourbons on the shelf, uh, not just whiskey. Did you say 120? Over 120. And you know what all of those are? I could probably name them to you if you really wanted me to eat. <laughs> So I'm very curious as to what drinks you chose for us tonight out of that many choices. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, being in Louisville, uh, I chose the, chose the Louisville original drink. Uh, okay. It's called an Old Fashioned. Okay, um, I didn't realize it started here in Louisville. Late 1880s, a bartender created a drink because the guy couldn't handle straight whiskey. So he made like him <laughs> with the quote-unquote Old Fashioned. So what all goes into this drink? Like I said, it's Louisville's original cocktail. Once upon a time, a lot of people will argue that it started with rye, a rye whiskey. And us being the bourbon capital of the world, we're gonna say that that's a lie. Um, <laughs> it has to have bourbon. A lot of people also argue that it doesn't have fruit. Contrary to popular belief, it did have fruit originally. He muddled an orange and a cherry to add some sweetness. Muddle them together, strain the fruit out because you obviously you don't want all the extra fruit in the glass. And then you can uh, finish it with a, a bitters of your choice. And we garnish ours with an orange and a cherry to make what we call Fred's famous old fashioned. Well, maybe yeah. this is a good drink for me then because a whiskey shot's pretty right, hard. Right, right. Oh, I could drink that. Yeah, yeah, That's it's, so uh, encouraging. It's There's very, hope for me. <laughs> That's really smooth. smooth. Yeah. yeah. That's what I was going to say. That wraps up this road trip through Louisville, Kentucky, but we're just getting started. We're headed for Texas when the Southern weekend continues. This Southern weekend, get ready for one of our biggest road trips ever. We'll visit the world's largest honky-tonk, where the drinks are cold, the music is rocking, and the crowds are Texas-sized. We'll have 6,000 people here this Friday night. 
They say everything's bigger in Texas. Take a look at these guys. Those steers have a horn span of up to 90 inches. We'll explore a flea market so large, you'd need days to make your way through it. I don't care what you're looking for, it's here. And along the way, we'll fill up on delicious food, from mouth-watering tacos, to brisket so tender and juicy, you'll want to jump in your car to get a taste. We're taking a road trip through Texas, right now on the Southern Weekend. I'm Molly McKinney. I travel across the South meeting amazing people, We're dancing with having a good time right. with it. tasting delicious food, that is outstanding, and exploring great new places to visit. I love weekends in the South, and I think you will too. Let's go check it out. So come join the adventure as we start the Southern Weekend. Our road trip across the Lone Star State begins in Fort Worth, a city built on cattle. Our first stop, the Fort Worth Stockyards, where twice a day, the streets are filled with these amazing animals as Fort Worth celebrates how it all started. Kristen Jaworski, you have the best job title I think I've ever heard, <laughs> which is? Trail boss of the Fort Worth herd. What do I have to do to get this job title? <laughs> It is pretty unique. It usually takes a lot of explanation. Trail boss. Trail boss, yes, because I manage the world's only twice daily cattle drive here in the Fort Worth stockyards. What was the stockyards used historically versus what they're used for now? So in the late 1800s, it became this metropolis, this uh, mecca for livestock, for horses, mules, hogs, sheep. It, you know, it was just very prosperous, and that's what really built Fort Worth. So what can folks see today when they come visit the stockyards? So you know something that's really unique is we get to drive these majestic longhorns right here along Exchange Avenue uh, every day at 11.30 and 4 o'clock and that really commemorates a time in history that that predates the stockyards when the Longhorns were driven right through Fort Worth along the Chisholm Trail in the late 1800s. You have to use your imagination a little bit because they drove two to 3,000 head of Longhorns in each cattle drive. Uh, we're driving 16, uh, <laughs> but they're still beautiful, majestic animals that you get a chance to, to be really you know, up close and personal to. You know, we have a million people a year that come just to see that, to take pictures, uh, to visit with the drovers, which are the cowboys and cowgirls, and a lot of them have never had an opportunity to see that ever in their life. I don't think and, I've seen a longhorn up close before. Well, and, and, and that's impressive that we get an opportunity to show you that. Those 16 steers have a horn span of up to 90 inches, so it's, you know, as they're walking along East Exchange Avenue, uh, they fill that street. <laughs> Good grief. The Stockyards Historic District is also a great place to do some shopping, grab a drink, or maybe even try some line dancing. So we checked out a club billed as the world's largest honky tonk, the one and only Billy Bob's. I don't know if I know the actual definition of a honky tonk, I just think of it as a bar. Yeah, well, it, the term honky tonk, it's a, it's a beer drinking establishment, but I was close. Uh, it, it, you're very close, and, and it's you know it includes dancing and live entertainment. Mm -hmm. But what really makes a, a honky tonk honk tonk is the ability to set you know have a table where you can set your beer down in front of you. That way you can go dance and uh, you know cut a rug. So you have a lot of tables to set beer, beers down then. Absolutely. What all can guests see here when they come visit? Uh, you name it, you know, we, we pride ourselves on live entertainment on Friday and Saturday uh, nights, from country music, rock and roll, the classics, uh, all the way to live bull riding. You know, we don't have mechanical bulls here at Billy Bob's, we've got live bulls. Uh, you can go check out our, uh, our handprint walls where famous artists like Johnny Cash, Garth Brooks, Willie Nelson have their handprints memorialized on a wall here. So we have a few, you know, a few names have come through here. How much square footage is this place to enclose all of this in one location? Over 100,000 square feet. 100,000 mm -hmm. square feet? Capacity, we hold over 6,000 people here. In one night? In you one can night. Have 6, people. We'll have 6,000 people much, here this Friday night. How much alcohol does that correlate to? It's a lot. Serving? That's a lot of alcohol. At a Hank Williams Jr. show, we sold over 16,000 bottles of beer in one night. Merle Haggard set the world record for the largest cheersing round of whiskey shots bought, and that was for 6,000 shots of Canadian Club whiskey in one night. This is not the place you want to be a hero and buy the bar around the shots. No, Merle Haggard figured that out the hard way. <laughs> 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 
Before we headed out of Fort Worth, we were ready for something tasty. So we stopped at a place known for its authentically Mexican tacos, the delicious Salsa Limon. What does a Mexico City taco taste like when you compare it to like the Tex-Mex that I think of when I think of Texas tacos? So um, I would say that the, the Tex-Mex deal is, sticks a little more to the fried and, and, and you got the queso and all these ingredients that are like, I would say a pizzeria but put on a taco. Uh, <laughs> more of them an, an American uh, ingredients put in a taco where we stick to just what you would eat when you go to Mexico City. You go around the streets on a taco stand. Um, all these fresh ingredients is what you're getting. We got tripa, we got tongue. Um, some ingredients that are very traditional in Mexico that you won't see in any other place. Yeah, yeah. I don't see tongue and try <laughs> exactly. on taco menus too often here. <laughs> Not very often. I think it's really cool that you guys are taking something that's been done the same right. for centuries and delivering that again and again and again. I think that's what stands out the part. It's, it's, it's the authenticity of, of the taco. It's so different. It's, it's not the Tex-Mex stuff that you're used to getting here. So what do we have to so do to get the first, started? First thing we do is um, we get the tortilla on the griddle, a uh, little bit of the butter base. We let it cook on both sides. And then we second that with, uh, with the cheese. We let it stick to it for a second and then flip the tortilla. Um, as we flip that tortilla, we let that cheese melt for a few seconds. What cheese do you use? That's Monterey cheese. Monterey. It's Monterey. Okay. After we pull that out of there, that tortilla is going to have that melted cheese uh, surface in the inside. And then we go for a scoop of uh, carne asada. And then I'm going to pass this to you and let you do the rest of it. In, in the, the cold, cold table. station, okay? So What's next? the first thing we do is a pick of um, onions. Okay. And then we go with the cilantro. Then okay. you're gonna grab a handful of pickled cabbage. There's perfect. That's more than I use that's, at home, so I'm already good. learning. And then you put a, um, a lime to decorate the plate on the edge of it. So just right, right there, that's perfect. Good and you presentation. Have it. You have it perfect. Approved. Yeah, hi. Well, I'd love to give it a little taste <laughs> give a little test try. here. Let's yeah. go for it. Should I go for the lime too? I'd say you put the lime on it and give it a better flavor. Okay, all right, I'll do it. All right, we'll take one bite. That's delicious. Not too bad, is it? Mm -hmm. Still to come on this Southern Weekend Road Trip, ever wonder how a cowboy hat is made? We'll find out as our Southern Weekend Road Trip across Texas continues.
Texas and cowboy hats go together like biscuits and gravy. So on our road trip, we swung through Garland, Texas, just outside of Dallas, to see how these hats are made and maybe even try on a few. How do I look? The cowboy hat has been a southern staple. Why do you think it transcends all of these generations? Well, a, a cowboy hat is, is great function. It keeps the sun off our face, keeps the body warm. The hat is a, a water resistant product, so it keeps the rain off, but also, you know, in the old days, they didn't have anything to dip water with. They would use their hat to give their horse a drink. And the last drop from our Stetson is an a iconic picture that's in a lot of our hats. And it's a fashion statement, too. A cowboy wants to be recognized that he's wearing a nice hat. What do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions about cowboy hats? Well, the number one thing is people always ask, what's in a fur felt hat? Well, fur is in a fur felt hat. There's no leather in it. There's no cardboard. The, uh, the rigidity or the stiffness comes from natural shellac. So you make all the hats here in this factory. I imagine there are quite a few steps in making a hat like the one on your head. Do you mind giving me an overview? We are uh, the largest quality hat maker in the U.S. We take raw fur, rabbit, beaver, hare's fur, and turn it into a hat body in our Longview felt plant. It's sent here to Garland, then Garland turns it into a finished product. So it's issued to the floor, it's blocked to the size and shape and dimension that it's going to be with the right size brim, then it goes through a pouncing process, which in layman's turn is sanding. We sand the brim and the crown so that it has a smooth, luxurious finish. Then the hat is shaped. We shape the crown first and then the brim. Then the trim is added to it. Your inside sweat band and lining, and then your outside hat band. And the unique thing about uh, the hat making process is how many hands touch a hat. Hats are made by people and not by the machines. Dan is going to show us how to go about choosing the right hat. So what's the first thing we need to think about? Well, the first thing you need to know, Molly, is what size hat do you wear? So what size hat do you wear? I don't know. <laughs> well, let's guess. Okay. Let's say maybe a six and seven eighths and see if that's what we want. Okay. So this hat is uh, not quite a six and seven eighths, but let's try it on to see how it fits. Okay. Oh, that feels good. Very close, very close. So where do you want it to fit on your head to know that you've, you've found the right size? Where it feels comfortable. Okay. You want it tight enough that it's not going to blow off. And my famous quote is, there's no cool way to chase your hat. <laughs> so let's <laughs> don't do that. The next thing you need to know is what's your function? What do you want out of a hat? Do you want a hat to go right all day? You're trying to keep your head warm or keep you warm? Or are you looking for something that's more fashion uh, and comfortable? This is what we call a crushable, so you can actually pack this on your trip. It has a snap brim that you can snap down. You can wear it flat like this, or you can turn it up and wear it like this. And that one fits very well. This one seems to fit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can shake your head when I shake the hat, so that's good. <laughs> that's what you want? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. But this is, a, this is more beautiful. of a dress hat, fashion hat here, so let's try it on and see, it's a see what you neat think. neat color. Very nice. What do you think? I think it's nice. I like this one. Approved. Where do I sign? Still to come, get ready to get hungry. We're sampling a Texas specialty, brisket, when the Southern Weekend continues. If you want to see more from any of our road trips, check out thesouthernweekend.com. You'll find videos of our adventures across the South, as well as great tips and recipes. All that and more anytime you want it at thesouthernweekend.com.
Welcome back to the Southern Weekend. I'm Molly McKinney. We're taking a road trip across Texas, and if you're anything like me, you like to do a little shopping when you travel. So when we found out that Canton, Texas has the largest continually operating flea market in the United States, you know we had to check it out. Just about every town in the South has a flea market, but this flea market in the state of Texas is pretty much what you'd expect for the state of Texas. Absolutely, we do it bigger in Texas. Does it take days to get through everything here? Oh, I would allow at least two days to do it properly because there's a, you know, if you have to stop and look at every 6,000 vendors booth, it does take a long time. Well, I'd love to see more, but I don't have two days. Oh, but I've got golf carts. Come on and I'll be happy that to show help. you around. All right. <laughs> describe this place? Oh, it's a little bit state fair, it's a little bit flea market, it's a little bit market days, just whatever you want to call it, and it's just fun. <laughs> is it sharp? It's sharp. Oh, God. Yeah. Dangerous. What is this? Yes, it's sharp and geez. That is a Bob wire a walking weapon. cane. That is the most rare walking cane of all the collectible canes. It was made it's a by walking cane? a what? walking cane. It well, was given it... away by the fence companies for advertising back in 1881. I thought it was a husband tamer. If you need to tame your husband, that's it. That would it. do it. I don't care what you're looking for, it's here. Finding it might be the problem. Uh, finding but if you is start the fun. asking around, but that's the fun. And it, I don't know how many acres are out here, but there's a lot of it. I think it's the oldest market in the world. It started in 1873. If you had extra pigs or chickens or something that you needed to buy or something you wanted to trade or sell, everybody did their business on that day whenever there was courts. We even have records of where two men traded wives on really? first Monday. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> These are made out of cowboy boot tops. Ah! And then they put a bottom in it and it's a purse. And See? it's a purse. Yeah. How long have you been here? I have been here three years. I have people that come from all over the country. It's going to be so neat to meet all it these is, different folks. It is, and that's why I like coming here because I stay in this spot. They know where I am mm -hmm. and they're going to come back every single month. It's just overwhelming. It just makes you feel this good. Yeah. I think people work hard. <laughs> Plus, there's a thousand places for them to mm -hmm. be able to, you know, spend their dollars. And, and they pick you sometimes. Yeah, and it's, yeah. it's very humbling. I, I find myself talking people out of it. <laughs> Are you sure you need 11 ponchos? Maybe you need five. You know? We are in the heart of downtown Sevierville. Uh, this is a wonderful historic district with lots of shops and restaurants and things to see and do. And of course, we've also got our statue of Dolly Parton, who's Sevierville's hometown girl. Being in the foothills of the Great Smoky Mountains, um, there are great opportunities to enjoy agricultural type activities when you come here. Um, everything from the Apple Barn and Cider Mill, which is a working apple orchard. Um, we've also got wonderful distilleries like Thunder Road Distillery, which is kind of a nod to our moonshine and bootlegging pass. Or you want to go on a shopping excursion, hit all of the high-end outlet stores at Tanger Outlet Sevierville, and even check out Smoky Mountain Knife Works. There's so much to do here, you're going to have a great time. When they come to the Apple Barn, we try to uh, make a lot of our Apple food products uh, so people can see that, interact with that during the day. And so we make uh, fresh apple cider and we make uh, apple fried apple pies and apple donuts and dumplings and whole baked pies. All that's done behind glass where you can see that going on, look into the kitchens and watch them make those things. Smoky Mountain Knife Works opened in 1990 right here in this spot. We've got something to offer everybody. It's a very family-oriented store, but we've got guns, gun accessories, knives, of course. We also have pots and pans, all kinds of housewares downstairs. The Relic Room, we've got anything from Eastern Europe, from the Bronze Age, all the way up to Native American artifacts down there. You can walk around here for hours and not buy a thing because there's so much stuff to see. When you come in Thunder Road, you, you don't just pick up a bottle of whiskey. You have an opportunity to see it made, you can smell it, you can experience it, you can taste it. We have several things that you can see that tell a little bit about the history of whiskey in the United States. So it's all here to be seen and, and experienced. It's a wonderful place to come and visit. We've got a lot of great activities for the family to do, uh, for couples to come and do. It's perfect for girlfriends, getaways. Sevierville has a lot of fun things for people to do.
Texas road trip wound up in Tyler, Texas, located an hour and a half east of Dallas. It's home to a mom and pop barbecue joint we had to visit, which has been serving up smoked brisket for more than 50 years. Stanley's Famous Pit Barbecue. Barbecue is a huge part of the culture in Texas. Stanley's is definitely a tried and true barbecue joint. I mean, it's not unfancy. It's, you know, really close to 60 years old. We want someone to come here and have all of the parts of the experience, you know, great food, be taken care of, understand that we're grateful that they're here, and then in return, you know, give them the experience of, oh, that was really fun, and I had a great meal, we've gotta go back. It's just a very simple place. It's a pretty simple food. I mean, not the process to making it, but you know, when you sit down, it's cooked meat and some really simple sides. You know, we just pair that with making sure the beer's cold and the music sounds good, and that it's a, a fun, happy place to be. Do you feel owning a barbecue joint here in Texas a big responsibility to serve awesome brisket? <laughs> I do, I mean, like, it's not an official, like, Texas state thing, like, you know, they have the state bird, you have your state tree. I mean, if there was a state meat, I'm sure it would surely be brisket. Texans take it really seriously. We, we try really hard to make sure that we're following the rules and, and upholding the reputation of the state meat of Texas. The unofficial. Yeah, the unofficial. <laughs> As a brisket newbie, how should I be ordering brisket? Good question. I think most people don't realize that brisket is inherently a really poor and fatty cut of meat, which is why the process of cooking it is so important for it to being so good. Initially, when you get a piece of brisket in front of you, you've never had it before, you know, if it's done right, there's gonna be a great little ring of fat on the outside. And the thing you don't wanna do is cut that off and get rid of it, because that's where so much of why it's so awesome is there. The salt and the pepper and the smoke and the rendered fat on the outside, it just becomes this own like separate done that every time. amazing part. So you gotta keep that on there. Okay. And then also my suggestion would be that you order the fatty cut with the bark and you're bark. gonna be, that's the outside part where the, where the seasoning and the smoke turn into this great crisp little. Fun little joy. Yes, absolutely. So don't cut it off, okay. embrace the fat. That wraps up another road trip. I'm Molly McKinney, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time on The Southern Weekend.